Print your own gun at home and ballistic coefficients this week on Mail Call Mondays. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Well, this Monday, we're going to diverge just a little bit from the precision rifles to begin with, and we're going to talk about a story that was just released in Forbes about a new 3D printed handgun. That's right, you can now download files from Defense Distributed and print your own handgun at home if you have a 3D printer. Now obviously there are a couple of requirements for that. First of all, you have to have a very expensive piece of equipment, a 3D printer. For those of you who are not familiar with it, a 3D printer is basically a uh, plastic printer. Uh, it takes uh, bulk plastic, it feeds into it, and then it extrudes the plastic through a nozzle, much like your printer would extrude ink through its nozzle, and it lays it down on a platter, and it uses this plastic to build up parts. Now, Defense Distributed set out plans for a actual working firearm, a handgun, comprised of 16 different plastic components that you can make on a 3D printer and then two metal components. Now the only two metal components in this firearm is the firing pin for obvious reasons. A plastic firing pin doesn't seem that it would work very well for any amount of time. And then the second component is a metal block. Now why a metal block? Because there appears to be actually a federal law called the U.S. Undetectable Firearms Act that requires that components be in a firearm that prevent it from passing through metal detectors undetected. So those are the only two metal components in it. Now this obviously, when the story broke, brought out people on both sides of the fence. Um, for the 3D printing crowd, it's actually a great leap forward in the functionality of 3D printers. They continue to expand the envelope of things that you can print at home on these things. They're actually fairly amazing devices. Um, on the other side of the fence, you have the people that are arguing against it because of legal implications. They're afraid that uh, obviously these firearms can be used for criminal endeavors. Now, I think the argument that the firearms can be used for criminal endeavors is a pretty silly argument when you think about it. The amount of experience and the amount of investment it requires to set up a 3D printer, set up the equipment, the software to program it, and to print this thing out is not small. It's a pretty large expenditure. Uh, you temper that with the fact that you can go out on the street and purchase a handgun for a very cheap price. Uh, it really doesn't seem to me that you're going to see criminals kicking in doors with 3D printed guns anytime soon. Additionally, there are the technical requirements. This is a single shot pistol. It has interchangeable barrels apparently to allow different calibers to be fired, but it's a single shot pistol. This is not something that your average criminal is going to want for uh, criminal enterprises. And it really, when you look at pictures of it, it doesn't even really look like a handgun. It looks more like a phaser pistol out of a uh, Star Trek toy set. So it's a very interesting design. But the bad thing that this has done is it has brought light to the fact that you and I can build our own firearms at home without any legal requirements. Uh, barring any state laws to the contrary, so again, always make sure you understand your state laws. Uh, right now, any of us that want to can build a complete firearm at home without any requirements to register it or notify the federal government of anything. Um, really, this this has always been a good thing because it has uh, really prompted innovation in the firearms market. I can take a uh, pile of parts and I can build my own firearm and try different things without having to ask the government for permission to do so. Now obviously if I intend to actually sell this, there are some legal requirements as far as markings and serializing and reporting at that point. However, just to put one together, a functioning firearm, there are not any federal legal requirements. Uh, an enterprising individual can go down to Home Depot 
and pull a bunch of plumbing parts off the shelf and some springs and put together a firearm. It really is not that difficult. Now, obviously, we're not talking about a quality firearm. We're not talking about something you're going to go out and shoot 500 or 1,000 yard competition with. Um, but a working firearm, yes, you can do so. They're really, firearms are not that complex for single shot devices. New York already has politicians that are standing up trying to pass laws to ban 3D printed guns. Um, there are already plans out there for 3D printed AR-15 receivers if you wish to go out and source them. We'll leave some links in the description below about uh, how to get to Defense Distributed's website and where to get the plans for both the Liberator pistol and the uh, AR-15 receivers that are floating around out there. Now. I really don't think this is a problem. I actually think it's uh, rather innovative and I'm kind of interested to see the direction that this goes. However, there are quite a few politicians out there that you'll see them lobbying against this, or not lobbying against this, trying to uh, make laws against this. Uh, I think that's kind of ridiculous, but I want to hear what you think. So please uh, leave me your comments in the descriptions below. Do you think that uh, it's a good thing that private individuals are going to be able to build untraceable firearms at home with the push of a button on a 3D printer? Or uh, do you think this is something that needs to be legislated and needs to be taken care of legally? Um, again, leave your comments in the comment section below. Last week, we had a question about different ballistic coefficients, and this posted a whole bunch of questions down in the comment section below. So I thought this week we'd talk a little bit more about ballistic coefficients. Now, there are three different ballistic models that we generally work with with our type of precision rifle shooting, and those are the G1, the G5, and the G7 ballistic models. Let's talk about each one of those individually. Um, the G and the number indicates which model or which reference projectile we're talking about, and then the ballistic coefficient is based off of that. Now, the model is a reference projectile. It's a bullet shape that the scientists decided to use when they're comparing the test bullet to the reference bullet. Now, for the G1, the reference bullet is a flat-based round nose projectile. So think of something uh, similar to a full metal jacket pistol round. Uh, that's kind of close to what we're talking about when we're talking about a G1 ballistic coefficient. Now, obviously, the bullets that we use are not anything like a round nose flat-based bullet unless you're trying to shoot a subsonic uh, projectile through one of these rifles. Uh, then you may be using a round nose flat base, but most of us are using something more like a boat tail hollow point. So the G1 is really the most popular, but it generally doesn't match our bullets really well. Now the G5, it matches our bullets a whole lot better. The G5 reference projectile is a boat tail hollow point, and the design on it is really a whole lot closer to what we shoot. Uh, it's still not quite there, but it's closer than the G1. The problem is you don't see a whole lot of G5 ballistic coefficients uh, listed, and you don't see a whole lot of ballistic computers that are set up to be able to use a G5. So really, we can kind of push that one to the side. What we see most right now in what applies a whole lot closer to what we do is the G7 ballistic coefficient. The G7 is a boat tail projectile, but it is a very low drag style projectile. So we're talking about a long, skinny, boat tailed bullet. This most closely matches what we're shooting in the high performance long range guns. Uh, for instance, the six millimeter, six and a half, seven millimeter uh, competition rifles. So the G7 matches up a little bit better to those. Now, we have an additional uh, little wrench to throw into things. On the G1 ballistic coefficients that you see most often listed, they're only listing one number. They'll say the ballistic coefficient is such and such. Now, the higher the ballistic coefficient number, the more aerodynamic the bullet is going to be, the easier it's going to fly through the air. So if you have a choice between a bullet with a high ballistic coefficient or a low ballistic coefficient, 
you want the higher one. Now make sure you're comparing the same one because G1 ballistic coefficients and G7 are not comparable. It's apples to oranges. So you need to make sure you stick in the G1 or G7 range. Now you'll see numbers posted for G1 ballistic coefficients and they may only post a single number and says this is this bullet's G1. Well, the problem is the G1 ballistic coefficient will change based on the velocity of the bullet. So if they're only posting one ballistic coefficient, you're not real sure what velocity range that was tested in or what velocity range that ballistic coefficient is accurate in. Now, I like Sierra because if you go to Sierra's website and pull ballistic coefficients, they banned them based on velocity. They'll say, in this velocity range, this bu bullet has this ballistic coefficient. In this velocity range, it's this. And in this velocity range, it's this. Uh, ballistic co calculators like Ballistic AE uh, will take into account the banding and will allow you to use the different ballistic coefficients for the different speeds. This will give you a much more accurate curve because as the bullet goes down range, it's slowing down and it's changing its ballistic coefficient through its path of flight. So you want to be able to use those banded BCs if possible. Now G1, they are on G7, there's only one number posted. G7 ballistic coefficients are independent of velocity. Um, I wish I could tell you why that works, but right now I just don't have the uh, capacity to be able to explain to you why G7s uh, work independent of the velocity. But they do, and so you only have one number posted for a G7. So if you have the option to use a single number G1 or a single number G7, definitely take the single number G7. Now in intermediate ranges, uh, 500 yards and in, you may not see really any difference between a G1 ballistic coefficient and a G7 ballistic coefficient. Uh, they may really run neck and neck. Um, when you map it out, you may see a divergence point though, a range that after this point, the G1 and the G7s are starting to give you considerably different results. Well, in that case, I would really suggest you use a G7 ballistic coefficient because after that point, um, it's gonna be a more accurate model of what your bullet is doing than that round nose flat based G1 model. So those are some things to keep in mind. Uh, really there's a ton of math and a ton of stuff behind the G1 and G7 ballistic coefficients, how they're come about, how they're tested to get those numbers, and it's really outside the scope of this short show here, but uh, we'll leave a link down in the description below where you can go pick up Brian Litz's book. Uh, he has two different volumes of books on how really everything you would ever want to know about the math behind ballistics. Uh, they're a really good read. Uh, if you really get into the science of long range shooting, they will uh, leave you with a whole lot of information and hopefully answer a whole bunch of questions. But if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, if you are a subscriber, thank you very much. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Of course, if you liked our episode, please give us that thumbs up uh, and we'll keep on doing what we're doing. Until next time, get out and shoot! Of course, I want to thank Long Range Precision for sending out the shirt of the week this week. Um, it's really pretty nifty shirts, has got distance on it, and they also sent us one of their leather slings that we'll be using in an upcoming video on sling shooting. It's kind of neat because it's one of the old school uh, Turner style slings with the uh, metal hardware. So we'll get into showing you how to use that a little bit later on. Uh, that's coming up, so of course, please stay tuned.